What if a toy could teach responsibility, grease, and without anyone ever planning it, the way tiny digital signals can tug at our attention? Well, in the 1990s, a keychain did just that, and it was called the Tamagotchi, and its ripple effects are still being felt today, right down to its hacker era cousin called the Ponagachi. This thing lives in my pocket, talks to my smart home, and eats Wi-Fi signals for its food. Stick around, this one is weird in all the best ways. It's Tokyo in the mid-1990s. A young designer named Akihiro Yokoi watches a TV ad where a boy is told he can't bring his pet on vacation. The scene feels unfair, and it plants a seed in Yokoi's mind. What if a pet could travel anywhere, he thought. What if it could live in your pocket? He begins sketching a companion you could carry everywhere. At first it looks more like a wristwatch than a toy. That's actually where it gets the name. It's a blend of tamago, the Japanese word for egg, with uochi, the Japanese pronunciation of watch. Put together, it becomes tamagotchi, literally the little egg watch you carry around and care for. To move the idea from paper to reality, Yokoi turns to Bandai. Bandai isn't just another toy maker. It's Japan's entertainment powerhouse, the company behind Gundam, Power Rangers, and arcade icons. Bandai has the reach to turn a quirky sketch into a worldwide phenomenon. The idea catches the attention of a marketer inside Bandai, and her name was Aiki Maita, and she does something a bit unconventional for the times. Instead of trusting only the executives above her, she speaks directly with teenage girls, the audience most likely to adopt something new like this. Their response is immediate. They love it. They see the charm in a digital creature that demands care. Maita champions the project. And suddenly, a fleeting thought in front of a TV screen starts its march toward global craze. From the start, Yokoi is clear. Tamagotchi should feel like a pet, not a mascot that blinks and smiles on cue. Real animals aren't endlessly adorable. They're work. They wake you up early, they make messes, they get sick, and sometimes, despite your best efforts, they die. Without those harder truths, he believed, kids would never form a true connection with such a device. So the team builds those rhythms into the egg. Fast forward a bit to 1996, and Tamagotchi finally arrives in stores, and literally within hours it's gone. Parents line up before dawn, and by spring 1997, the craze crosses oceans. American toy stores sell out by lunchtime. TV shopping channels move thousands in minutes. The world is suddenly obsessed with a tiny egg-shaped screen. Children smuggle them into classrooms, sneaking feedings under desks. Teachers, overwhelmed by the beeping, start banning them outright. At offices, some parents actually Tamagotchi sit for their kids' Tamagotchis. I don't think that I was able to convince my parents to do that for me. For many kids, this was the first screen that didn't just entertain. It wasn't just a one-directional viewing experience. It was an interaction, something that they were actually bonding with. It asks for care, and if neglected, it can be lost forever. I remember when my first Tamagotchi died, I held a little funeral for it. It might seem silly to outsiders, but emotion doesn't check whether something is flesh or made of pixels. If it asks for attention and answers back, we bond to it. By 1998, the fever begins to break. Furby bursts onto the scene, soft, furry, and endlessly chatty, crucially, without the constant threat of digital death. Parents find it easier and children find it fresh and novel. Plus, knockoff virtual pets were flooding the shelves. The beeps that once felt alive start to feel nagging, and thus the craze cooled. Tamagotchi didn't fully vanish after the 90s. Bandai continued experimenting with theme variants and reissues throughout the 2000s and beyond. It came back strongly in 2004 as Tamagotchi Connection, which introduced infrared communication so devices could link up, visit, and even marry. Over the years, there were color screens, smartphone tie-ins, anniversary editions that kept the brand alive for both kids and nostalgic adults. Most recently, in July of 2023, Bandai released the first Wi-Fi-enabled version of the Tamagotchi called the Tamagotchi Uni, or Uni, which connects players worldwide through a metaverse called the Tamaverse. The Tamagotchi never hit the same frenzy craze that it did in the 1990s, 
But its spirit endures, transitioning from a fun fad to cultural icon of the 1990s. Speaking of Wi-Fi, let's talk about a very different kind of pocket companion. Meet Ponagachi. It takes Tamagotchi's feedback loop, attention, mood, small wins, and gamifying data, and reimagines it in a tiny e-ink device powered by a Raspberry Pi. Instead of digital pellets, it feeds on wireless signals, things like SSIDs and Wi-Fi handshakes. As it gains experience, it face shifts from curious to bored to satisfied and happy, and its experience bars increase. But make no mistake, this is a very capable learning tool, and it packs some pretty impressive capabilities. I built mine with a Pi Zero, and I also have a Pi Sugar 3 attached here for battery. And I've got a little e-ink display that hooks right onto here. This is a totally solder-free project, which is kind of nice. And I had a few plugins installed, which allow me to see the battery and some of these fun little things like experience points and age, which keep it interesting and fuel the gamification side of it. It really feels like a modern cousin to the Tamagotchi. It does have a sinister side though, and this little device should be respected and used under controlled conditions. While it's an incredible learning tool, you should understand the risks if you want to build something like this. Stick around after this short message from our sponsor, and I'll tell you more. Building a device like this means brushing up on the basics or building a foundation of knowledge, and the experience is similar to what you can get from this video sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is an interactive learning platform that can teach you programming or tons of other things in interactive and fun ways. Each lesson is filled with hands-on problem solving that lets you play with concepts instead of just watching videos, a method proven far more effective than passive learning. Brilliant helps you build understanding from the ground up, and its interactive style feels a lot like tinkering with a Raspberry Pi. You learn by doing, and if you're starting from scratch or just getting back up to speed, I recommend checking out Brilliant's Programming with Python and Thinking in Code courses. To learn for free on Brilliant, go to brilliant.org slash throttlebuilds or scan the QR code on screen. Brilliant is also giving away 20% off an annual premium subscription using my code. Thanks so much to Brilliant for supporting this channel. One of the most talked about features of the Ponagachi is its ability to capture Wi-Fi handshakes. These are brief exchanges that happen when a device joins a network proving knowledge of the password without sending the password itself. Tools like Hashcat can try to crack those handshakes offline, testing thousands of possible passwords until they find a match. And if you have a strong enough GPU, even without a password list, most WPA and WPA2 passwords can be cracked in a matter of hours with a strong enough GPU. And here's where I want to be really clear. Just because a Ponagachi can do these things doesn't mean you should do them. Attempting to crack networks you don't own is illegal. Laws vary depending on where you live, but in most places, simply listening to wireless traffic is not considered a crime, but the moment you attempt to decrypt or crack handshakes that you've captured, then you start to step into legally risky territory. That said, this is an incredibly fun learning device, and the nefarious potential adds to its allure a little bit. Just understand what you're building before you fire it up, and you can install a plugin like Cuffs to restrict which networks it's allowed to attack. And that brings me to my next point. Aside from a nerdy fun little gadget, I have found it to be somewhat useful in hardening my own networks. In that way, Ponagachi becomes actually a network auditor for you and helps harden your networks in its own little way. What makes this more than just a network sniffing gadget are all the plugins that you can add, enhancing its personality and gamifying all the data that it's collecting. The most popular plugins let you track its age, its experience, and its strength based on epochs, which are basically the training cycles that the device runs through to shape its behavior. Each plugin adds a layer of personality giving the device something that you'd expect from like an RPG character or the original Tamagotchi. I'm actually working on a custom plugin right now called Nomadachi, and this plugin gamifies it further. If you connect a GPS to your Ponagachi's USB port, it can actually track GPS coordinates along with the handshakes that you're gathering. And my Nomadachi plugin is basically using these GPS coordinates and unique SSIDs to give you a traveler score 
um, just adds another layer to the gamification. And again, there's another way that I can learn and program this thing even further. I think what also makes the Ponagachi special is the community that seemed to develop around it. There's a pretty active subreddit where people share builds and tips and the occasional new plugin idea. And on GitHub, contributors refine the code, fix bugs, and keep the project alive. And then there's the creative physical side where makers on Etsy are selling custom cases, decals and accessories like this 3D printed case that I picked up. I haven't installed my Ponagachi in it yet. This just arrived the other day but I'm looking forward to it. And who doesn't love some translucent plastic? It's a global collaboration where hobbyists, programmers, and tinkers contribute in their own ways to keep it all going. Not unlike the Home Assistant project. And speaking of Home Assistant, of course I had to tie it in there as well. I noticed there was not a Ponagachi Home Assistant integration that existed, so I took a crack at making one. It's still very much in an alpha state, but using the Bluetooth radio on the Ponagachi and Bluetooth proxies they have at my home, I can have the Ponagachi basically chirp to Home Assistant and update it in real time. So anywhere I have the Ponagachi around my house, I can take a look at Home Assistant and get an idea on how the little guy is doing. Like I mentioned, it's still very much a work in progress, but if you'd like to try it out, the integration link it should be in the description below. All right, well, that's going to wrap up this one. Thank you very much for being here. I hope you found the video interesting or learned something. Or perhaps it activated some nostalgia if you too played with the Tamagotchi when you were younger. If you want to try building your own Ponagachi, check out the description below. I've got a companion blog post that goes over the entire process of how to build it, where to get the components, the plugins I'm using, and everything else we talked about today. And thanks again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. And I will see you in the next one.